Fine. Great to, great to have you with us. If you're just coming through the door, Audrey might have a last minute tea or coffee, if you're lucky. Audrey, are you closed or are you still open? <laughs> it's down to me. Everyone seems to be, everyone seems to be sitting down. So, um, yeah, if you want a last minute tea or coffee, then just go very quickly to Audrey. So, um, yeah, a bit of a different morning um, this morning. I decided, I don't normally do this, but I decided that before church I would um, I'd go to my allotment. Um, not something I do very often. When I got down uh, to my allotment this morning, there was double the amount of soil that there was the last time I got there. I don't know about you, but the plot thickens. <laughs> now, again, you might probably, as you are thinking, well, you know, he's just throwing a joke in at the beginning. But no, because this morning we want to talk about going deeper. See? Link? Yeah? Anyway, go with me. Um, <laughs> we want to talk about depth to our faith, because it's one of the things that you often hear about as a follower of Jesus. It's like, oh yeah, are you, are you, a, are you a deep Christian? It's one of those kind of jargon lines that we come up with. But really, when we're talking about it, all it means is that God wants us to come closer to him. God wants to know about every area of our lives, and he wants to deepen relationships with us. I know it's something I've said many times, but several years ago, um, when Emma and I had started dating, she, um, she went to South Africa for three weeks. And um, I wasn't expecting to hear from her um, over that three weeks at all. It was kind of the time when international telephone calls still cost quite a lot of money. And um, so I wasn't expecting to hear from her. And I remember bizarrely in the middle of that three weeks the phone rang and I picked the phone up and she said those two words she just went hi it's me and being the attentive loving boyfriend that I was at the time I went who's me <laughs> and didn't recognize her voice at all now hopefully 19 years later I think or whatever it is from that moment if that happened again I would recognize her voice but really what it means to go deeper in our faith is that we see God at work in lots more different ways. That in a sense what we do is we become God conscious. Wherever we are, whatever we're doing, we're aware that God is with us and God is at work. And so my prayer for us today as we just go through our service is that you would become, maybe in a small way, in a big way, and really, more importantly, as you go into your week ahead, that you would become more God-conscious of his work in your life and his love for you and his love for people around you. Now, one of those moments in life where we become uh, a little bit more at times God-conscious is at a wedding. And it is fantastic for me. The first time this year to be publishing some bands of marriage and it's amazing to have Steve and Jennifer with us uh, this morning as well. And it gives me great pleasure to publish The Bands of Marriage between Stephen Allen Cummins and Jennifer Maynard, both of this parish. Now, if anyone knows any reason in law why Stephen and Jennifer should not be married, you must declare it now. It's when they do the nervous like, look round. Fantastic, guys, that's the first one done. That was for the first time of asking. So one tick, <laughs> two more to go. Well, let's stand together and we're going to pray for Stephen and Jennifer and uh, for ourselves as we uh, begin our time of worship. Let's stand together. Father, thank you for your presence. And Father, we pray for Stephen and for Jennifer as they prepare for their wedding day that they would become more conscious, more God-conscious of you in their lives and in their relationship. And Father, we pray for us today that we too would do the same, that we would be more God conscious wherever we are, whatever we're doing, whatever's happening in life, we would see you at work. Lord, take us deep.
Let our praise be your welcome. Let our songs be a sign. We are here for you. We are here for you. your breath come from heaven fill our hearts with your life we are here for you we are here for you you are to Fantastic. Thanks, Tris. It's that time in our service where most of us want to go out to the vestry, but it's only stars and crash who are allowed to go and their leaders. So guys, have a fantastic time. You can go. It's good. Oh, see you guys all again at the end. Have an amazing time. The rest of us grab a seat where you are. And my question for you this morning is this. I think you're going to have to think back on this one. What is in your life the greatest answer to prayer you've ever experienced? I'm just kidding. I'm not sure I've ever prayed. Maybe that cancels me out. But I need to think back. What is the greatest answer to prayer you've ever experienced? I'm just going to share mine with you while you are thinking. If no one's got anyone, that's absolutely fine. But if you've got a story to share in a few moments. And... After that um, moment with Emma when she was in South Africa and not recognizing her voice, she did forgive me. And um, uh, four years later, we got married. It took, it took quite a long time for her to forgive me. No, I'm joking. It was just four years later. Four years later, we got married. And um, 
as we were preparing uh, for our wedding, um, my mum was battling cancer. And it was actually the weekend of Emma's hen weekend. Um, em went off with her, her girlfriends on her hen weekend, and I went um, back home to see mum and dad. And the day before, uh, my dad phoned me and just said, just so you know, mum's been admitted to hospital. And um, so instead of going home, I went to Colchester Hospital to, um, to see them there. And I walked into the ward at kind of the wrong moment. Because when I walked into the ward, um, my mum wasn't in a very good way. And the, um, she was coughing a huge amount. And there were lots of doctors around her. And they were trying to clear um, stuff from, from her lungs. And um, it was the first time she'd had, um, she was diagnosed with cancer in 99. This is now 2003. So it's been quite a four-year um, four battle. And it's the first time that I'd seen her in quite a lot of, um, quite a lot of pain um, and discomfort. And I kind of remember going back to my dad's house uh, afterwards, after we'd been there a few hours. And you know, my dad was obviously quite emotional and kind of quite upset. And we didn't, in one sense, talk at that point, because I think the two emotions were too high. We didn't kind of talk on the level of, OK, let what are, we, what are we dealing with here? What, what's actually the prognosis? What's ahead of us? Um, I'm fortunate to have um, an uncle who is a consultant surgeon. So when I got home that weekend, I decided to, to call my uncle. And I said um, to uncle, what? I, I need some straight answers to straight question. Um, what exactly are we dealing with? I think at this point it was about six weeks before the wedding. And um, I said, you know, what, what is going on? And my uncle said, look, obviously I've been following your mum's case and um, that we, we categorise cancer patients um, as either having days, weeks, months or years with a terminal diagnosis. And that's the first time I'd even heard terminal diagnosis talked about. And I said, OK, then be straight with me. What are we talking about? And he said, your mum's got days. And six weeks before our wedding, this was like, oh, my word. But Emma comes back from her hem weekend and um, sit down and I said, look, you know, this is, this is cold, hard facts of what we're facing. What do we do? Do you think we should bring the wedding forward? Do we delay it? Do we keep it? What, what do we do? And um, Emma, being the far more spiritual and wise person than I am, she said, well, we need to pray about this. I was like, that's a good, a big good idea. Good idea in this moment. Let's pray. And I remember we, we, we got down, and I remember kneeling on my knee, kneeling down, because, you know, this is you know, pretty much in that situation. You know, I'm going to physically lower myself because, God, I need, I need an answer. And we started praying. And into our minds as we were praying came a passage um, of, from the Bible from two kings. And everyone was like, I just think we need to read this passage in two kings. And we read it. And it, the passage was all about kings going it off into, into battle. And it was about this king. And before he went off into battle, um, they worshipped. And they spent time like, just telling God how amazing he was. And as they were telling God how amazing he was, God said to them, you won't even need to fight this battle. And just look and see. The verse said something along the lines, I haven't really looked back at the passage, but he said, just, you will not need to fight this battle. Look and see what I will do, or words to that effect. And so we said, okay, but we think, and Emma said, like, I think we need to worship. And together we just said, God, we love you. We think you're amazing. Um, we're just putting you in charge of this situation. We cannot sort this out. And then a couple of weeks after this, my dad phoned and said, oh, they've done a procedure on your mum, and she seems a lot better. And the cancer had spread to her lungs, and what they had managed to do was they had managed to seal the wall in her, I don't understand this medically, but apparently they'd sealed the wall between her lungs and where the cancer was getting in, so they basically managed to put a block on the cancer. And when it came to the wedding day six weeks later, she was incredible. I remember going the night before um, into her, their hotel room where they were staying, and I'd not seen her for a few weeks because she'd been in hospital, um, I'd just keep, been keeping up to date uh, from my dad with what was happening. He was like, hey, just concentrate on the wedding. You don't need to come. You don't need to come. Just uh, see you the night before. So I went in the night before, and I remember walking into the room, and it was like a miracle for me. How she was in comparison to how she'd been six weeks before was extraordinary. 
she was fine for the wedding day. Emma and I went away on honeymoon, came back from honeymoon, and again, she seemed, it was incredible. The rest of that August, she was seemingly getting better, and I thought, we've, we've got a miracle. But the procedure they'd done was only temporary. It was only going to last a little while, and then 25th of September of that year, she went back into hospital, and she died on the 5th of November. And at her funeral, I remember looking back and just thinking, Thank you, Lord. That was the most incredible answer. She had days to live, and he gave us months. And she was able to be there for our wedding. She never forget the week before she died, she wrote us all letters telling us how, you know, to go on and kind of live our lives and how proud she was of us. And all of those things I don't think would have happened if we'd not prayed. And it was an extraordinary moment. And I still look back to it now and go, yeah, do you know what, God? You are involved. You are there. You step down from heaven. You reach down to us and you move in our lives. So, any stories anybody wants to share about Amar's answers to prayer? Like, I know that's, quite, that's what I said about your, your biggest one. So, it's kind of like, and like, yeah, go Wendy. Yeah. Do you want to, Wendy, you Come, 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 because they need to, people on the camera need to hear what you're saying. So, I know you hate it, you can kill me later. <laughs> Sorry. Well, no, it's just um, lovely to see so many new young faces and a wonderful worship leader um, and just a different service than I was brought up with and that we had here for many, many years. It's just great to have that choice between the 9.30 more traditional service and the 11.15 a bit more informal. That's it. Brilliant. Thank you. Thank you, Wendy. Anyone else want to share anything? Go on, Reg. You asked what was the greatest answer to prayer. And um, when our first daughter was um, about to be born, after 38 hours of sitting by the side of my wife, moving my arm at the same rate as she told me to, <laughs> which was breathe, pant, pant, breathe. Anyhow, after 38 hours, the point where... It was too late for a cesarean section, and it was 2.30 in the morning. I decided that prayer was needed. <laughs> and so therefore, I took the great liberty of ringing my mother at 2.30 in the morning and said, I want you to ring all the elders. I want them to pray. 2.30, 3 o'clock, our first daughter was safely delivered. But... It was a momentous decision to actually say, Lord, we need an answer here because the midwives and those looking at her said, mm, we don't really know what to do. So anyhow, she was safely delivered and it was followed by three more later. So we have many answers to prayer. Thank you. Quick question that's coming to my head, probably many others, is how's your arm? <laughs> after, after four of them, that's quite... Cool. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> Brilliant. Last call. Anyone else want to share anything? And the reason I've gone for... Oh, Andy, you, you, you flinched. <laughs> Go on. Go on. I think uh, my brother had meningitis when uh, over in Australia and he was in a coma and my mum's also, um, as you know, in, in the ministry and her church did a, a prayer chain at the time, um, had the phone call to sort of fly over there if they could um, because the doctors thought, you know, it was pretty touch and go whether he was going to survive. Um, so my mum and dad uh, went over there and uh, he had a pretty miraculous recovery and he his 
uh, he came to faith afterwards, uh, and he he's given sort of some talks to his church and congregation about um, his experience of uh, the love of Christ at the time. Um, and when he was in, in a coma, felt uh, an amazing sort of sense of warmth that Jesus was with him um, and helped him in his recovery. So, yeah, pretty amazing. Thank you, Andy. And also, folks online, if you've got any stories uh, that you want to share um, as well, just put those um, in the chat and we'll keep on those. And the reason I went for greatest answers to prayer is that sometimes we need to remind ourselves of the huge things that God has done to realize that he's also as massively involved in the small and the minutiae of life as well. God is involved and he's around everything. The Bible's really clear. No height nor depth nor anything else in all creation is able to separate us from God's love. Jesus said it himself. His last words before he went back into heaven was, surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. And so part of us going deeper in our faith is just being more conscious of God and what he's doing. We're going to pray again and Tris is going to lead us in a couple more worship songs before Miranda comes and speaks to us. Let's pray. Father, thank you that you're here. And Lord, we want to be just come more conscious of you so that our relationship with you would deepen. Our love for others would deepen. Our stress and anxiety would decrease. Our peace would increase. And knowing that you are in control, that you know the beginning from the end. In Jesus' name, amen. Stand together, Tris is going to continue to lead us.
Step down into darkness, open my eyes, let me see beauty that made this heart. do take your seats and after a long time of um, planning and preparation when I say a long time I mean about 90 seconds of pre-warning Reg is going to come and bring us our reading from Galatians our reading is taken from Galatians chapter 3 and commencing at verse 23 Before the coming of this faith, we were held in custody under the law, locked up until the faith that was to come would be revealed. So the law was our guardian until Christ came, that we might be justified by faith. Now that this faith has come, we are no longer under a guardian. So in Christ Jesus, you are all children of God 
through faith. For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourself with Christ. There is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, nor is there male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. If you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. May the Lord add his blessing to that reading of his word. Thanks so much, Rich. Hello, everybody. Well, I wonder if you could make a lot of sense out of that passage. I know when I first read it, I didn't. <laughs> but here goes. I'll try, try and bring a little bit of light to it. Uh, Paul, of course, is in the middle of explaining to the Galatians why it was necessary for Jews and Gentiles Sorry, let's just say that again. Why it was not necessary for Jews and Gentiles to abide by the Jewish law and its traditions, such as circumcision, now that Christ had come and died for them. Paul wrote this letter because he was concerned that many of the Galatians were being persuaded by a group called the Judaeus, to, that to believe in Christ, you have to win your salvation by conforming to the law rather than to believe in Christ and his resurrection and his ascension and his giving of the Holy Spirit. So this is what Paul told these Galatians, that salvation is by God's grace and our faith in Jesus Christ. The Ten Commandments were given to point the way to God. Keeping them entirely was just not possible. It was not possible to win salvation from God. And there's a big difference between a sort of traditional adherence to Christ without a desire from the heart to live God's way to me, when I was looking at it, 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 it seemed to me that uh, I could make a bit of sense out of it by thinking about my own journey of faith. I was brought up as a Catholic and uh, spent 11 years in a convent. And um, I went to church every Sunday. I uh, was told that I needed to go to confession, and I was given a book of sins when I was about <laughs> when I was about ten. I remember this, and I was told to sort of pick out a few sins, <laughs> and I used to say every time, um, "Forgive me, Father, I've been disobedient," and other such sort of matters of childish um, sins. And actually, to be honest, I didn't really think I had been disobedient, but I had to say something. <laughs> and then one day I got fed up with this line of saying I've been disobedient. So I pick another one and I said, forgive me, Father, for I sinned. I have been guilty of thought, word, and deed. <laughs> she said to me, I don't think so, my child. Are you really sure at your age that you've been doing such things? <laughs> so I didn't know what to say because I didn't understand. So this was my experience of ongoing religions. You had to go to church on Sunday. You had to go to confession and pick out a few sins. And then it came to a bit of a head when I was asked by the priest um, who was marrying me and Oliver um, to sign something saying that I had to bring up my children as Catholic. And at the time, I was having sort of some queries about faith. I, I really couldn't see that uh, having to go to church on Sunday, having to go to confession, having to do all these things was the God that I wanted. I told my mother I 
wanted to get married in an Anglican church, and she was absolutely horrified. And she was a very, um, she was a very forceful woman, my mother. You know, she was, she was, she went to university in Sydney during the war when it was not the sort of thing to do. She studied Greek literature. So, but to her, her faith was very meaningful. And so she actually took to her bed for two weeks. She actually became depressed. And so I actually had to do mental gymnastics with my conscience. And I signed that bit of paper and got married in a Catholic church. But this sense of God, it was really a sense of doing my duty. You know, I was told I'd go to church on Sunday, so I did it. Um, but it was very dry. There was no excitement in it. I didn't have a relationship with Christ. It was, it was a paucity about it. But then some years later, um, I, I did become a true disciple, I think, of Christ. And I committed my life to follow Christ. And um, I, I actually felt God calling me to consecrate my life to God. And that was a, a phrase that I thought, you know, any priests and, and nuns consecrated their lives to God. But this was the word that he used for me, presumably because he thought I might understand it. Um, and so I did. I did take that step. I didn't know what I was doing, but I took that step. And um, suddenly everything changed, completely changed. I had a relationship with God. I began to know him as a person, not just as a thing that I had to do. I felt his love just surrounding me. And in that love, there was a sense of timelessness and sort of perfection that everything was fine. There was a sense of peace. There was a sense of purpose that God knew the plans he had for me and plans to prosper and to heal me. I could sense his speaking to me at times. I could sense what was God and what was not God. So there was a beginning a sense of awareness of his presence in my life. And together with that, there was an excitement. I used to literally run up the street to the Sunday evening service where we uh, taught about spiritual gifts. The spiritual gifts uh, are prophecy, um, words of knowledge, speaking in tongues. We were learning about that, and I was given the gift of tongues, and I found that it was an amazing way to pray to God. It was a sort of direct relationship between my spirit, not my spirit, but God's spirit in me, and God, and my mind wasn't present in this. So it was sort of God speaking in me to himself, as it were, very odd, and I didn't know what was being said, but I trusted that it was God using that sort of gift in me for his glory. I um, also sort of sensed this wonderful um, in God improving my character, if you like, through prompting me to um, ask for forgiveness for various things and showing me the depth of God's um, of how actually we can be not on God's plane. And it was a sort of sense of purification and growing more holy, if I can put it in that way. And I could sense God leading me and making me down, I'd lie down in green pastures, taking me to places where I never could have thought I would go. Not physically I'm talking about, but in terms of my spirit life and my general peace, he would make me lie down in these green pastures. It wasn't me trying to do it. He was making me do it, but in a very gentle way. He was my shepherd and I was 
hoping I was letting him lead me. And I was eternity bound. I just knew that this was the right course um, uh, in, in my very center of my being, as John Wimber used to say, in, in my Noah, I just knew that this was God. And actually, if I'd sum up all of this, it was a time of huge abundance from God. He took my little, tiny desire to consecrate my life to him, and he filled me with love, and he filled me with his goodness. And I was a child, I felt like a child of God. If we look at the passage, we will see in verse 26, for you are all children of God through faith, faith in Christ Jesus. And he was comparing that, Paul, with those who didn't have that faith in the same way in Christ Jesus, those who were uh, abiding or trying to abide by the law, and they thought that this was what was going to make them right with God. But it wasn't that. It was by inviting Jesus into their lives and taking what he did seriously, his forgiveness of sins and his dying for us, his resurrection to give us new hope and new life. I wonder whether you've experienced, I'm sure many of you have, this, this love of Christ. But we can always go deeper. I think that's the thing. There's always more and more of him. He is an abundant God, has abundant gifts for us. If we just look at Psalm 123, and the Lord is my shepherd, um, he prepared a feast for us, a feast. And it's a bit like also the prodigal son. And when the prodigal son comes home, the father is waiting for him. The father's waiting to welcome him. No matter what he's done, that's not the important thing. The important thing is that the son has come home and wanting to make good. It's the same for us, that any little um, way that we go forward towards God he just meets us with incredible gifts and abundancy. So going back to the passage here, in verses 23 and 24, Paul is saying that the law was like a time when a person was a child looked after by a parent, nanny or slave, who would teach them the way to honor God and to live in God's way until the time when Jesus, until the time when they would, they would find the way of faith through Jesus Christ. So that by welcoming Jesus into our hearts and lives, we can be united with him. So there's that contrast by those who are living out of a sense of law, out of a sense of duty, like me when I was going to church every Sunday because I was told I had to do it. I had to go to confession. I had to do all these things to be right with God. Um, but that wasn't the case. I needed to welcome Jesus as a person into my life to find him. And um, in verse 27, Paul likens this event to how in Roman society, a youth coming of age set aside his robe of childhood and put on a new adult toga indicating the move into adult citizenship and responsibilities. So there comes a time in our lives when we need to say, 
okay, I've learned about God, but now is the time to commit to him as a person. So Paul was saying to the Galatians that when they became Christians, they in effect laid aside the clothes of the law and put on a robe of righteousness. And verse 28 of the passage sheds light on what happens when we turn to God and ask for his forgiveness of our misdemeanors. Once we accept Jesus, we see that there is no difference in our minds, between Jew or Gentile, those who are male or female, or slave or free person. So there's no difference actually between any of us. We're all God's children, we're all brothers and sisters, and we all have that unique ability to, to communicate in the, in the love of God. That, that becomes a difference and, and a joy in communicating with people who are children of God. So, putting all that together is wonderful news, opening the door of our heart to Christ. And we sang that wonderful song right at the beginning, opening our hearts to God. Uh, and that's what it's about. It's it's about taking that step towards God or towards wanting more of God. I know the moment I made my commitment to Christ and I heard that word consecration, it was hard, you know. I had no idea really what I was doing. Um, and it was a bit like... Uh, walking on water, you know, like Peter walking on water. I took a step of faith. And amazingly, this sort of abundant new life came my way. It, it was out of all proportion to the courage that it took me to, to make that commitment. You know, it's a free gift, except uh, it's a free gift for us. And... Jesus has done all the work on the cross. He's taken our place for all the misdemeanors we've done. We don't have to earn anything. He just accepts us as a child. So, just to end on this verse from Revelation, chapter 3, verse 20, that will be familiar to us. Jesus says, See, I'm standing at the door and knocking. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come and eat with that person and that person with me. So it's not us knocking on the door. God, where are you? I wonder where you are. It's not. It's the other way around. God is always knocking on our door. And it's but us to open it and ask him in and then he will spend time with us he will eat with us he will spend time in our lives he will be there actually all the time the lord i just pray i pray for us all that you would take us deeper deeper into the realms of knowing you and loving you and wanting more of you in our lives. Wherever we stand, there is always more. Bless us now and fill us with your Holy Spirit. Let's take a, a moment or two just to open that door a little wider to God. Amen. I believe that God wants to say something to us. Um, he's saying something to us this morning about different areas of our lives. And this whole thing about 
going deeper today. It's about trusting God in different areas of our lives where right now maybe we're struggling to trust God or we're not trusting God. And uh, just as Miranda was talking there, and then when she finished up with the, um, the verse from Revelation about um, the fact that Jesus would come in and eat with us, it's a, that's quite an intimate thing. It's quite a um, kind of personal thing to allow, you know, we, we think about having people around for, for come around to, to your house that you come in, you know, those that you let in socially, you make a decision about it. Yeah, I'm going to, you can come, but I'm not sure about you and I, I like you and I'm, I'm not sure. Jesus says, I'm going to, I want to be, have that level of relationship with each and every one of you. And I sense the day of God kind of saying to us, do you trust me in this area of your life? And we've all got loads of different areas of our lives, from our work life, our social lives, our family life, um, the area of finances in our lives, our own physical health, mental health, all sorts of different areas of our lives, and just a sense of God saying, do you trust me? Do you trust me in that area of your life? I've got it, and I will lead you. Miranda talks about Psalm 23, which is that amazing psalm when David, writing it, talks about us being sheep. It's a picture he paints. We're sheep. God's our shepherd. And he will lead us through all sorts of different stages of life. And I just sense God saying today, do you trust me? Do you trust me? And the amazing thing about faith is that's all we have to do is just say, yeah, God, I trust you. I had a moment in the 9.30 service uh, this morning. And I'm you're looking, a lot of you looking at me like, yeah, I can see you've had lots of moments. Um, but I had, a, I had a moment at the end of the 9.30 service this morning. We'd, um, we just shared communion. And um, uh, people were coming up to here and were lighting candles. And generally people do that in giving thanks and giving memory for, um, for people that have, that have passed away. Um, and this was an emotional moment for me, and I'm about to say it's an emotional moment for Alison because I've told her about it already. But um, and Malis Alison's um, uh, dad um, used to sit there, just in front of where Wendy is now on that chair. And um, Derek was an amazing man, and I had the incredible privilege of baptizing him in 2019, and his faith really came alive kind of later, later in life. And I, saw, I remember... Um, Derek, just week after week, just coming and receiving communion at the end of a service and beaming. And it, his life was just full of that joy and that, that Miranda had just been sharing. And as people came forward and were lighting candles at the end of the, the service, I was just led to this verse. In Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 1, it says, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, Let's throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. And do you know one of the things that hinders us in our relationship with God is that we don't trust. And I know I massively struggle with trusting God in all sorts of different areas of my life. But that verse reminds us we're surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses now, that cloud of witnesses is partly us cheering one another on, but it's also a heavenly crowd of witnesses. Are those wonderful people that have gone before us, like my mum, like Derek, like people that, you know, maybe we've lost in the last little while are up there cheering us on, going, go on, you can do it. You can keep going. Because they've got rid of all their pain and their struggle and their difficulty. And like, you, do you know what? But actually, persevering in faith is quite difficult. Do you know what? Sometimes it's even easier just to keep going through the motions of going to church each week or doing the right things that we think we should be doing that's going to make God love us, but that's not how it works. Actually, it's just believing. It's like, God, I've, I've, I'm going to trust you in this. And so what we're going to do, um, it's before I close this morning, we're going to get Tris to, to lead us um, in our final song. And I'm going to ask us this morning, and I'm going to stand here, um, if you'd like to, just to make a, um, almost like a sort of public declaration of commitment. 
and we're just going to base the front. And it's just a public way of saying to God, yeah, God, you know what, I trust you in that area of my life where I haven't been trusting you before. So maybe it's your relationships, money, work, family, whatever it is. And so just invite, you don't have to do it at all, but it's like a public declaration saying, yeah, God, I, I choose in this moment to trust you. And it may be, as Miranda talks about, you know, it, it's your whole life, maybe for the first time, you're going to choose to trust God. And there's areas of my life right now that I know I need to trust him, and I'm gonna, just going to stand. And as we sing this final song, um, as Tris plays, just come and just stand and say, go. Make a public declaration, just saying, yeah, God, I choose to trust you. You don't have to talk to anyone about it. No one's going to ask you any questions. It's just between you and God, saying, God, I choose to trust you. So let's stand, and uh, we're going to sing our final song, and then we'll do collection after that. Um, but for now, if you want to come and just, just come and stand. Amen. We're just going to um, pass the collection bag uh, around now. So, uh, Trish, we just want to just <laughs> continue playing um, just for a few moments. Um, Sunday Club um, team will um, begin to wander back in uh, in a moment. I can see them coming past the, the window now, and then we'll just close with our final blessing in a minute.
trust in you. Amen. Do grab seats just for a moment. I think Sunday Club are probably on their way back across the road. Um, at the minute, just a couple of things uh, to let you know about. Um, tomorrow morning, for those of you that are around Cornerstone, it's open um, again from 10 o'clock. And Reg is going to be there, I believe, um, doing your technical bits tomorrow morning. Yeah. Do you want to just quick quick announcement from Reg about what he does at Cornerstone on Monday morning? He hasn't been here for a few weeks, so he's grabbing me. Um, but tomorrow, 10 o'clock, you may not know how to use your smartphone, but on the other hand, if you could ask your seven-year-old, they would know. Um, if you're a granny, then maybe ask your grandchild. They'll, they'll be all right. But what I'm trying to do is just to say, 10 o'clock to 11 o'clock, any problems with your iPad, your laptop, be it PC or Mac even, can I say, hands up, who has a Mac? Hands down, who has a PC? Well, I think the PCs win slightly, but... Um, we are. <laughs> well, different computers do different things. Macs are very good for publishing things and doing design. Anyhow, he asked me, that, you see, it's wrong, you shouldn't ask me, should he? Because I just carried away. <laughs> Brilliant. I've seen firsthand this man solve many people's computer problems. So, uh, yeah, coming to that OSB tomorrow at 10 o'clock. Now, for those of you who were here last week, you will remember that um, I did a talk about um, and gave people opportunity to come to faith uh, for the first time. It was amazing. Four people uh, made commitments to Jesus last week, which was absolutely brilliant. And um, I said... Um, one of those moments, well, a lot of moments I have in my life, where my mouth runs away but instead of my brain. I talked about the fact that when um, people come to faith, it's great to throw a party to celebrate because that's what happens in the Bible and that's what happens in heaven. And so I said, because people have come to faith, we're going to throw a party. So being a man of my word, that's what we're going to do, people. Saturday the 5th of March in the OSB from 7.30 in the evening. There's going to be drink, there's going to be food, there's going to be music. Come along, um, bring your kids or get a babysitter, entirely up to you, um, 7.30, 5th of March in the OSB. Do come, just be a great opportunity just to spend time together. We haven't been able to do it for ages. Um, so, yeah, just come along, have a great evening together. See you then, bring a dr drink and food with you if you want to as well, but there will be um, stuff there, so come. More details to follow about that. I think that's it. So I think Sunday Club are reappearing. Um, as well at this point. So let's stand together. We're just going to pray our final blessing before we go. And obviously to you guys listening online as well, of course, everybody is welcome to that party. So do come. Okay, let's pray as we um, finish today. Father, thank you for being with us. Thank you that you've been with us in all of our different groups, all of our buildings, all over um, the site and we pray that as we go into our week we would become in loads of ways more conscious of you in all sorts of things in all sorts of ways and now may you bless us and keep us may your face shine upon us and be gracious to us the lord look kindly on us and give us his peace and the blessing of god almighty the father the son and the holy spirit may it rest upon you and all those who you love both this day and forevermore amen it's been great to be together, guys. Uh, see you again 